Let me show you what they did to me when I opened the last program. terrible well that's not going to happen again no sorry I've checked every inch of this set oh that was fairly solid though and that can't happen again thank God it's really this is really solid tonight so let's get on with the show oh! <laughs> It's sad to see you as you've never seen before. On Monday, I'm Tuesday, I'm Wednesday, I'm Thursday. The four days of the week you see. On Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, we give you top variety. Stories, but some of them are new. I run the hock shop weekly and sing a song or two. While I spend it's all day, when only the best will work. We hope that you will all agree to join us here on IMT. This is my lucky day. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for this? Don't start yet. <laughs> Are you ready for this, ladies and gentlemen? The world's greatest ventriloquist, the great Alberto! I might mention to you, for a ventriloquist, the hardest sound, the hardest sound to get is the sound... The hardest sound is the sound of B. B for... B for... Uh, And all dragon gusher, dragon gusher, dragon gusher. Tremendous. <laughs> you must give it more feeling, you know, get carried away somewhere. <laughs> you gotta move, you know, you gotta go, you know. Go, man, go, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little scream. <laughs> Do that again, I'll break your leg. <laughs> That was a joke, Joyce. <laughs> it's the Graham Kennedy Show. And now, here's Graham. Your Majesty! <laughs> Don't sneak up on me like I dropped all my dinner fright now out of me. Pick up my dinner. <coughs> Your Majesty. Pick up again. Pick all my dinner up. Pick up my dinner. Pick that up at once. Our king is talking. If you don't pick that up, Bert, you won't be in the next series. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? I'll try this one, eh? Right. Yeah. 
handling those crush nuts brilliantly, Bob. <laughs> There's the inevitable cherry, brilliantly done. <laughs> and here it comes. How would you like a good poke? Gave me an order, I went to fiddle that. <laughs> no. Soldier, as you know, we are engaged in an orphan. No, but... <laughs> Soldier, as you know. I might take this off. You know I'm a captain, don't yes. you? Yes. Call me Major Rotorhead. We are Major Rotorhead. We are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a word to you later, Corporal Punishment. What will it be? <laughs> As you know, we are engaged in an all-out war against flies. True. Now we've got a brand new weapon to help us, and the brand new weapon is this one. It's called Johnson's Protector. Oh, yes, with the sharp shooting top. Deadly to flies, but completely safe to use. I'm saying, Right, pick up your weapon and shout proudly in your hand. <laughs> Next case! Oh. <laughs> 25 years. 25 years in the business, my knob's never come off before. <laughs> Humility and modesty <laughs> prevent me from saying anything further. Tonight we're very excited about the Logies because for the very first time they're not fixed. No, no, no. <laughs> and now here's the moment that you've been waiting for. The announcement of the Gold Logie for 1973. It's Tony Barber. I suppose it is about time that uh, something else apart from a surname of Kennedy won it all the time. <laughs> and I would like to thank me for being a grand little performer. I beg your pardon? <laughs> uh, the award for the best new drama has been won by number 96. <laughs> to accept it, Mr. Bill Harmon. Here you see, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest assemblance of perverts. <laughs> Strange people, oh, in, in their roles, I mean, but lovely people. Bill, it must be a great personal thrill for you. I just wondered if you want to join us. I said I wouldn't cry. Well, don't cry then. Do you want a handkerchief? No. That's good, I haven't got one. <laughs> Debbie, don't be upset. This is going to be the... I'm this... not upset. Well, I know you're happy. Before you start handing out these awards, we'd like to make an award now for the uh, the best and fairest uh, announcer award, which is the Auntie Jack Golden Glove Award. Uh, goes to you there. Huh? I've had producers and directors who've worked very closely with me over the years, and cameramen, scriptwriters. You find all performers who mention these people when they receive awards. And I want to say, I got this just my own work, not this. <laughs> I don't mean that. I want to thank everyone. You're all lovely. You're all lovely. 
Jack, you're Aussie, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, you can't be a star in Australia, can you, if you're an Australian, see? <laughs> well, all the stars out in all English, aren't they? Or Yankees, see? This is something which is never asked of an overseas visitor here, so I hope you don't mind if I add lib madly. But what do you think of Australia? <laughs> uh, I, I love Australia, and I, I love the Australian people. You're warm and, and sexy and marvellous and <laughs> terrific. Just thinking, wouldn't the Southern Cross Ballroom make a beautiful spot for a wedding reception? <laughs> Is that a proposal of some sort? I... No, well, no, no, no. <laughs> no, David, if I change, you'll be the first. But... <laughs> I really, I really know, I really didn't know that this, this was going to happen. And um, I have an affliction, it's called emotion, and... Uh, oh, sh**. <laughs> Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. I really do. I really. I, uh, I would like you to meet my two sisters, Patty and Laverne, here. On behalf of my, uh, on behalf of my squad, thank you very much. Yeah. Good night. I might mention to you also. It was my fault. That was one for a particular episode in the series. And Mike just mentioned the particular episode. Uh, this is Michael Willisy speaking. I'm sorry you can't see me, but I hope you can hear me. Believe it or not, we've just lost lights in our studio, but we can get on with the program. Uh, our lights have returned, but we're taking no more chances. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But uh, if it was uh, uncomfortable for you, I can assure you it was worse for me trying to read from my notes. One year from now, this shot will look as dated and as dead as used Christmas wrapping paper. For all these girls are wearing minis. One year from now, they would not be seen dead in one. For a high proportion of Australian women, the ones with the forget it proportions, 1970 is the same fashion-wise as 1969 or 1959. For them, fashion never changes. Indeed, it hardly exists. If you are alive to fashion, the mini is dead. We call it murder, by design or certainly by designers. What then do the oracles foretell? First, Prue Acton, whose husband stopped her wearing any more minis by the simple device of burning them, every one. The shape of things to come are in these dresses from my summer collection. Uh, it may take two years, it may happen overnight, but definitely lengths are becoming longer. Pantyhose are taken for granted now, but as Leon Worth explains, their development has been a sudden bonanza. Let's look at the history of pantyhose. In 1966, we didn't produce any. In 1968, we produced a million and a half pairs. In 1970, we're going to produce three million pairs. And in 1972, in my opinion, we'll produce just as many. Women want freedom. It's uh, quite interesting about the subjugation of women throughout the ages, you mm. know, how they've been dominated by the male. Yeah. Uh, you'd be mum, would you? Oh, yes, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, not too much milk. No. I like yeah. it quite strong. Is that all right? Yes, thank you. And I think Miss Greer, who is not an unintelligent woman, no, has great. raised a number of interesting and salient points. She raised two on the cover that caught my attention. <laughs> I'd go to bed with Dudley Moore if he asked me. The man that I've got quite a yen for at the moment, although he have, would have nothing whatsoever to do with me, is Prince Charles. I think he's just uh, such a gorgeous personality. Well, the things that first attract me to a man are, um, I like very soft, effeminate sort of looks that hide a kind of really tough, butch, ruffian underneath. <laughs> I admire one that perhaps doesn't have a, a large beer gut, but I don't mind a small one. I'm very pervy about long legs. Um, hands, because they can do such fantastic things with their hands. Anybody can. I think the whole part of a man's anatomy can turn you on, except for one thing, feet. <laughs> <laughs> but then you could do marvellous things with a big toe. <laughs> Tonight, National Nine News looks back at some of the historic events from the past quarter of a century. Melbourne, October 1970. The collapse of the Westgate Bridge. 
A huge span weighing more than a thousand tons crashed down onto the Yarra River construction site. 35 workmen were killed, some riding the span to their deaths, others crushed beneath it. By 1970, it was the anti-war movement which filled the streets. This was Australia's largest protest, 70,000 at a moratorium march in Melbourne. The biggest movement calling themselves members of the Vietnam moratorium campaign, mainly students, moved down from the Sydney University via Broadway and George Street. Pressure was building to end the war on any terms. The Sydney moratorium is over for the moment. Jim Whaley reporting for National 9 News. Australia is perhaps the second most racist society in the world. Goff, Goff, Goff Whitlam, where the hell do you get a Christian name like Goff? <laughs> Can you imagine when his father went in to see him in the hospital and the mother's holding him? He said, what are you going to call him? She said, Goff. <laughs> he said, why are you going to call him Goff? She said, because he looks like a bleeding Goff. <laughs> Wept to office on the It's Time theme in December 1972, Gough Whitlam turned Australian politics on its head. Whitlam, a man who really had flair and who made mistakes, but on the grand scale. He let an awful lot of things get out of hand. And from there, the events that flowed seemed to flow with, with the inevitability of a Greek tragedy. And what has always had me baffled is Bill Hayden warned Whitlam of the possibility that Kerr would dis dismiss him after Hayden had paid a visit to him. Others gave him similar warnings. And yet he went out there with his mind completely unprepared. So there were shrieking people in King's Hall, shrieking mobs outside. Whitlam was swept along by the emotion of the thing and he made that impression address from the steps of Parliament House. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. What sort of pressure was John Kerr under to make that decision? Oh, I'd say he was under very heavy pressure. The historical factors were very large. Brisbane, January 1974. For four days, beginning on Australia Day, the city was virtually isolated from the rest of the nation by floods. 9,000 people were displaced from their homes as the waters of the Brisbane River swirled higher and higher. By the time the crisis was over, Brisbane was left with a death toll of 15, a heartbreaking clean-up and a damage bill estimated at $200 million. On Christmas morning, 1974, Australia learned that the city of Darwin had been devastated by Cyclone Tracy. 63 people were dead or missing. Hardly a building was left intact. There was need for help on a massive scale. Taking charge of the relief operation was the head of the recently formed Natural Disasters Organisation, Major General Alan Stretton. I remember the first scenes of Darwin. It was about 10.20 on Christmas night. Normally you'd expect the city to be lit up. There was complete darkness. It literally looked as though a nuclear weapon had hit the city. We couldn't see in the dark. And then once you could get through to the people and let them know what you were doing, calling for forming committees, the people did it all themselves. They came out of the rubble, they were tremendous. 35,000 people were evacuated in five days. There wasn't one loss of life after the cyclone struck and everyone got together to help their fellow Australians in distress. Hobart 1975. A wayward freighter, the Lake Illawarra, smashed into a pylon of the Tasman Bridge on the night of January the 5th. Twelve people died, seven crewmen from the sunken freighter, five motorists whose cars plunged off the shattered bridge before they could pull up. For the drivers of these two vehicles, a night not easily forgotten. Fraser? Well, I think history's still got to sum him up in many ways. Well, he's made a lot of mistakes in his treatment of people. In the broad, the mistakes have not been recognised by the elector to any great degree because they've just kept on re-electing him since 
75. Walk, I think, is a good Australian, capable, ambitious. Will Bob Hawke ever be Prime Minister of Australia? I don't know. It's a possibility. Would you like to be? Under the very great pressures of the job that I have, I tend, I think, occasionally to take too much refuge in having a drink. Um, and I think that's helped me, uh, but on occasions I've taken that refuge too much. Um, if I moved uh, from this position um, into politics, I mean parliamentary politics, uh, I would feel that I would have to uh, make sure that that didn't occur, which would mean I would have to uh, entirely become a, an abstainer. You would think you'd need to become a total abstainer? Yes, I think so. I think I would because uh, there have been occasions in, and this is a very frank thing to say, but you know, I try to be honest in answering. Uh, I don't think in the situation where you were uh, that sort of leader, uh, and perhaps leader of your country, that you could run that sort of risk. And uh, in the past, occasionally, I have put myself at risk. Well, that's rifle fire, repeated rifle fire. Before we heard mortar going off. Now, as far as we understand, the Fretland are the only ones with mortar. But cameraman Brian Peters, who shot that graphic film, reporter Malcolm Rennie from Channel 9 Melbourne, and three newsmen from the Seven Network were killed when Indonesian troops invaded East Timor. It was nearly two years before the circumstances of their death were confirmed, and Indonesia revealed the existence of this mass grave near Jakarta. The bold street overpass in the Sydney suburb of Granville, the scene of Australia's worst civilian disaster. A crowded passenger train from the Blue Mountains was derailed just short of this bridge. It struck a pylon and the huge concrete span supporting the roadway crashed down onto the tracks below. 83 people lost their lives. Leading the police rescue effort throughout the Granville operation was Sergeant Joe Beecroft. When we looked over the top and saw the bridge down there, the feeling was, oh blazes, what are we going to do? Teams of investigators scoured two blocks of Sydney's main street, looking for some evidence as to who was responsible for the Hilton bomb. Often throughout the morning, the scene resembled a battleground. It's really an appalling scene. It's a great tragedy. It's a great crime. And I think that Australia can mourn the fact that now we've had introduced in our community terrorism against innocent and uninvolved people. I believe that the finest cricketers in the world and the finest cricket that the world is going to see is going to be played in Australia for about eight to ten weeks every summer difference to me when we started out playing World Series cricket and there were only a handful of people in some of the stadiums because I've always said that uh, it was the it was the competition that got me going. And he's, he's gone. He's gone. Magnificent. But the big change was night cricket. That was, that was the thing that really turned it for World Series cricket. And that's gone in the air. Someone is under it and it's going to be caught. Magnificently caught. What a great catch by Rodney Marsh. That is unbelievable. The first night game at uh, VFL Park at Waverley, um, there was quite a good crowd turned up uh, at the start of play. Came back out to play the second session. Suddenly, the ground was, you know, there was 38, 39,000 people. I think that was the, the day come night that we all felt, hello, this thing has turned around. John Cornell came in the room and said, Dennis, come upstairs. Went upstairs and we walked into a little executive room up the top of the uh, SCG and out the back there's a window and, and you can see out the back and there was files of people, like thousands of people in lines trying to get in. 
And Kerry Packer took Cornell and I across to the, uh, the window and said, have a look at that. And we look, as we looked, he said, we've made it. I think we've ended up doing a service for cricket, which has been good for the game, good for the individuals, and good for the general public. The Logie Awards have been held for the last 12 years here in the, the Southern Cross Ballroom. Uh, we were going to change this year, but would you believe around Australia that in Melbourne, the, the Southern Cross Ballroom is the, is the only place which really hasn't got down the centre a cricket pitch? And it's... Oh, I didn't... I didn't, I didn't realise sir, that, you, that you were here. Uh, but I... Mike McCull-Jones wrote that, sir. <laughs> Isn't he a bad man, eh? My name's Andy Sigley, by the way. If you don't know who I am, I'm sort of television's Al Grasby. Is that right? <laughs> Happy the bride that the sun shines on today. Hey, ding dong, I've been waiting for you. Hey, hey, Ernie, <laughs> I want to marry you too. Are you on? Are you real? Are you on a real job? Or just the cold and lonely, the real world. young girl who an incredible amount of time has uh, become one of the biggest uh, female names here in Victoria. She started off with the young talent team. Oh, how long ago was it, Debbie? How long ago did you start with young talent? Three years ago. Three years, was it? Yep. I'll tell you what, this studio is that big. I'm not used to this. You lean over like that, you can't even see anyone. You hear me down there all right? Three years ago, Debbie. Isn't she lovely? How old are you now, love? Uh, 16. Hey. So you've been singing professionally since you were 13? You have been singing. Can I hear you? Can't you hear me? No. Oh, I'm sorry, love. Well, we'll have to we'll have to fix that, won't we? Right. You you've been singing professionally for three years. Uh, five. <laughs> five years professionally, have you really? Yeah. What do you do now? What sort of work since you've given up the young talent time? I haven't given it up. <laughs> Are you still on it? I didn't know that. Well, I never see it. I've never seen it, actually. I'm sorry, that probably sounds very ignorant. I don't uh, watch children's shows because I cry. You know? <laughs> That's true. I do cry. I do, because it takes me back to my young days when I used to sing on children's shows and all the trouble I used to get in. I remember it. And so I cry about it. I'm sorry, I didn't realise you. You're getting a bit old for young talent time, aren't you? 16 oh, years yeah. of age. Oh, well, Johnny Young, he's about 43, he's all right. <laughs> Straight as Liberati. You realise you're the first contestant on Australian television, a live variety show to be seen in colour. You don't really what? go to bed like that, do you? Yeah. I put that You'll have to marry a Chinaman. Because <laughs> they've got patience. <laughs> Mr Newton. What gives you this sense of inadequacy? Well, you see, Doctor, all the men I know had relations with their wives before they married. Mm. I never had sex with my wife before we were married. Did you? I don't know. What was her maiden name? <laughs> Dad, I'll have to... There's only one thing you can do. I'll have to give him mouth to mouth. Oh, I've never done this with a... <laughs> with an ostrich. <laughs> oh, I 
think it was sick. I've got a hot flash for you, I think. Are you for gay lib? <laughs> gay lib? <laughs> well, actually, I'm for gay gay lib. Margaret? It's no use. I just can't seem to bridge the, the gap between us. I think I'll ring that marriage counsellor. Don't bother. Why not? I'm already here. <laughs> Soft lights and sweet music, huh? What we need is loud music. Plenty loud. Pussy. <laughs> yes, now you can buy pussy in a can. <laughs> in a can, what will they think of next? <laughs> Peter, could you cut away from me for just a moment? <laughs> Pussy in a can! <laughs> Tom Piper, Tom Piper, Tom P-I-P-E-R It tastes real good when you eat their put Tom P-I-P-E-R oh. How am I going so far? <laughs> All right? Yeah. You've given me confidence. It's nice to see you becoming formal. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought it would be formal tonight. I, I really On this auspicious, happy yeah. occasion. Are you happy? Oh, yeah, I'm very happy. Mm. Yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fool around. Don't fool. Do I have to pay you to be good? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll be like you. Good for nothing. <laughs> Thank you. You can stick the teeth in your beak and get a bit of a smile, but show everyone how you can blink. Oh, must I? Right. <laughs> Daryl's a star. In fact, when I, uh, you know, the, my original deal uh, with the network was for six weeks, and I thought that'll be lovely. And I, I, I Daryl won't be embarrassed because he knows I put in a very strong word that, you know, uh, should I be on my way, that Daryl take over the show because I think he's a very talented young man. Over my dead body. <laughs> tonight. Now, I've dug up this bloke around my suburb. He's only new. Matter of fact, he ran third in the talent quest out Dandenong the other week. But I want him to make his debut here tonight. So, like, shut up and give him a go. I mean, he's nervous and he's raw and he, he hasn't got much talent, but he's in there trying and working all the time. So give him a big warm welcome uh, and make him feel at home. His name's Jimmy O'Keefe and he's only new, as I said, so give him all the best. Jimmy O'Keefe. Give him a big welcome. We passed from Louisiana down to New Orleans Way back up in the woods of money up a green Stood an old cabin made of earth and wood And there's a country boy named Johnny B. Gordon Why break us all? Now listen Let's step it out We'll turn around Turn around do the eagle rally. Come on, 
mind is clearer now At last all too well I can see Where we all soon will be the Channel 9 Moomba feeling. I want you to meet the star of Morgan Mindy, Mr. Robin Williams. This is scary. Oh, look, somebody's fantasy. <laughs> I didn't win anything, did I? You won me. Lee, it's... Uh... <laughs> Gosh. You look great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Someone said to me the other day, there are three ages in life. Youth, middle age, and gee, you look great. <laughs> this, is, this is my newest acquisition. See, this is one from, that everybody talks about, and it's a set. See, it matches the ring. And uh, I brought it over because I just wanted to let the people know that I wear all the jewelry and that everybody makes fun of it, but I'm straight. <laughs> Whatever that means. I like the boy. <laughs> did, did, he say, did, he say, did you say Roy or boy? I like the boy. There's something wrong with saying that? Roy. Yeah. Hey, hang on, hang on. No, no. I'll change religion, I'll do anything for you. I don't care. Where's that whiskey? <laughs> the winner is Michael Caton. Michael Caton. Uncle Harry in the Sullivan. Am I right in saying this is the first personal award that you've won? No, uh, but I treasure it just the same. Uh... <laughs> I'm the proudest bloke on the world, Fenningham. <laughs> oh, Fenningham, Fenningham. Oh, just amazing. So I have never felt as thrilled since rehearsal this afternoon. Uh, what a tremendous shock, viewers. Um... No, it, it really is, because mainly because um, I thought I was getting a gold one. <laughs> Golly, there's so many people to thank. Um... Vinci uh, Rabinzo, the cab driver that brought me over here tonight. <laughs> Mr. Whippy for a lend of the coat. I would like to thank very much the big bosses who back us up all the way. I would also like to thank the little people. 
those people that work on the camera crews and the writers and all the other ones that submit things to us. <laughs> so that we can be successful the way we are. I would like to thank, I would like to thank Robin Williams, our overseas guest, for showing up. <laughs> I also thank the staid Auntie ABC, who had the guts to put through two people, Molly, which is me, and to make a guy named Shirley, two guys, Molly and Shirley, and if that's not a breakthrough in television, nothing is. There are a lot of other people. Yeah, I'm sure you'll think. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, Jean Gare, Ross Burton, Would you like me to thank my wife too? Oh, no, I'm just thrilled that no one was drunk this year. <laughs> and darling, also, thank you, Channel 7, who said that they'd try and help me develop this year. But so far, nothing much has happened. And I know you'll know that I mean this when I do it. Here, pal. Six months in your house and six months in mine. How's that, all right? memories of the great years with Graham. I've got now. Very nice, very nice. Hi. Hi. And <laughs> I think they all are. Now, you know you're pretty, don't you? What do you do to stay so pretty? Oh. <laughs> don't do that to me now. You do, that's, your, that's your style. You turn things around so that it, it's, it's going to end up with you interviewing me or something. Well, you'd be surprised. Oh, no. that pretty boy image in those days did that make you have to try what about it yeah well <laughs> i'm really jealous it. not everybody I was that good looking <laughs> well i should have be good looking than ugly wouldn't you yes of course <laughs> did it make I'm you sorry it's the way it is for you but <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you're attractive to women um, i don't think about it you know i mean if a good looking bird passes by you don't pay attention no? That's not a logical sequence from what I just said. Right. <laughs> I saw a statement by you one time. Now, I don't know if that's just publicity or not. They said you would not do nude scenes. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> what, uh, what, would, what would be the hesitation? Uh... Oh, well, there's a few reasons for that. Um, <laughs> well, firstly, God, I mean, who, who, who I think he just turned red. The man is blushing here. <laughs> Who, who wants to see it, you know? I mean, really, it's, uh... I haven't got anything else that anyone else hasn't got. Uh, <laughs> you work good. I fill the stage with me. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> your physical attributes were a bit more famous than your musical ones for um, a while. I'm not being smart, I'm just no, saying it, Anna, it's, you're I nice, can't help it, but okay. they're here. And, uh, <laughs> Say it's what's up front that counts. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks for the memory. <laughs> they tagged me with this, with this term, kook, for some reason, because, uh, I don't know, I guess I just sort of do what I feel. But I looked it up, and it comes from a city in Australia called Kookaburra. 
They are thinking, when is this idiot going to stop talking? And I no, I'm not. How I'm marvelous a... this is to be on the air, flashing my ego. My <laughs> ego. <laughs> a kookaburra is a bird. Do you know that? Well, maybe it laughs like a jackass. And it I don't does. know. It does. Very heavy bird. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we got another heavy bird. You're coming out here. There's a heavy bird coming oh, out here. Scared me there for a minute. No, no, I've no. I've seen no. your picture, but I don't know how heavy your bird is. <laughs> but if, if you were to be in love with John Travolta and had a romance, I mean, that certainly would put you on the front page as a lot heavier. Than, why are you smiling? Do you have a romance with John Travolta? Or what? <laughs> I'm just tired. From traveling? I've been flying for a year. <laughs> well, when you come down, raise your hand. I'd be glad to talk to you. Was your second <laughs> I got through. I how long have you been singing? Pardon me? I said, how long? <laughs> I'll get right here with you. I'm all right. Don't worry. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to do this interview with you. That's it. Thank you. There you go. Well, you got people working for you and everything. That's right. <laughs> All of it, it never fails, Tom. I get, you know, you can ask for anything you want on this show and we'll have someone go out and get it for you. Christ. <laughs> I, uh, we tried to get him, but there wasn't enough money. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Are we still paying you, Bert? Yeah. I said, are we still paying you? Oh, you wouldn't you? miss it. <laughs> I'd like to announce the uh, introduction of World Series Cricket. <laughs> Could you hold these for me, please? What do you think? Bert and I belong together like ham and eggs. See, I put you first. How's you doing? It's gone public. <laughs> there are people in King's Cross would pay big money for this. <laughs> I've seen you there, darling. Shut up. <laughs> and it's unbreakable, as you know. It certainly is. Yes. That's as translucent as the finest china, but it takes a lot of beating. Ha -ha. Beat it. Beat it. Show them how you can beat it. from Sammy. I got this. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> my personal mentor. Is it? Yes. Sammy Namajira Jr. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, he's a Wollongong, sir. Oh. Um, uh, part of Aboriginal Jewish song and dance man. You Is know? that right? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. No. No, he, he sung more people to death than Demis Roussos. <laughs>
must have, must have been a big thrill for you seeing people like Demis Roussos and Sammy Davis out here, knowing that they may see you work live in concert. Live on stage is what you're really all about, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's a... Well, I like working uh, live on television, but you don't get much of an opportunity anymore. I mean, uh, the, the uh, Mike Walsh show is the only show that goes out live now, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've actually, I don't like working on the Mike Walsh show, because, I mean... You know, Wait, it was, it's the same network. Can you tell me softly why is that? It's a bit disconcerting. I mean, I've died in front of an audience many a time, but it's a bit disconcerting when you see the audience dying in front of you. <laughs> Her name is Lola. She was a showgirl. But that was 30 years ago when they used to have a show. Yankee Doodle went to London just to ride the pony. Well, I am that Yankee Doodle. And find I'm king of the hill, top of the heap. That's all we have for you tonight. 
But before I go, this station has asked me to announce that the report of a bomb being planted in Studio 9 here in the studio audience has been deemed a false alarm. So I'll just say... <laughs> religious costumes and for the use of the New Testament. <laughs> and our special thanks also to the Australian Broadcasting Board of Control for all their free publicity. Thank you. <laughs>